Good afternoon, and welcome to the CCOF Foundation Pathways to Farm Ownership webinar. Our two presenters will review different types of lease structures and tactics that can lead to farm ownership. Before we begin today, I wanted to thank the USDA Division of Rural Development for funding this webinar as well as to note that any opinions, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this webinar are those of the authors and do not necessarily reflect the view of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. If you're having difficulties connecting to the webinar, if you can't hear or can't see, please call our office for support at 831-423-2263 press zero for the operator, and someone will help you connect to the webinar. My name is Megan Donovan. I will be your host today. I'm a program specialist at the CCOF Foundation. The CCOF Foundation advances organic agriculture for a healthy world through education and hardship grants, technical assistance, and consumer education. We are very pleased to have Leah Schwartzman from California Farm Link and Michael Parker from the National Young Farmers Coalition with us today. I'll introduce each one in more depth prior to their presentation. Before we get started with our first speaker, I wanted to let you know how you can participate in today's web event. We're looking at an example of the GoToWebinar attendee interface, which is made up of two parts, the viewer window on the left, which allows you to see everything the presenter will share on their screen, and the control panel on the right. Within that control panel is how you can participate in today's event, so let's take a look at that. By clicking the orange arrow, you can open and close the control panel. From the view menu, you can also set the control panel not to auto hide when inactive if you prefer to always keep it open. The audio pane provides audio information. By default, you have joined the webinar via mic and speakers. If you prefer, you can join the audio via telephone by selecting phone call and the dial in information will be displayed. During the presentation, you can send questions to our webinar staff through the questions pane. Simply type in your presentation and click send. Throughout the webinar, we will stop from time to time for questions and answers. We will answer as many questions as we have time for. Today's webinar is being recorded and everyone will receive an email with a link to view a recording of today's event along with a PDF of the PowerPoint slides. Today, we also have a copy of the PDF of the PowerPoint slides available for download through GoToWebinar. Click on the blue file name of the handout in the handouts pane. A PDF of the slides will open in your internet browser. You can view them from your browser or download them onto your computer. To expand or collapse the handouts and questions pane, click on the triangle next to the name of the pane. For example, if you can't see the box of the questions pane, click on the triangle and it will expand the pane to show the box. So we wanted to encourage you to test out the questions pane, write in, let us know where you're calling in from today and what you produce on your farm and ranch. Um, and just to note, we have a nice crowd in the audience today and we're gonna try to get to as many questions and comments as possible. Um, but we wanted to apologize in advance if we don't get to your specific question and encourage you to follow up with us after the webinar. And also just to note that Mike's presentation is going to be, uh, will be easier to understand if you have access to a screen and can see the visuals. So if you are calling in just by phone, um, but have access to a computer or um, could watch the visual through your cell phone, we encourage that because um, you're going to be doing a tutorial. So it's easier done um, visually than just by hearing. So thanks again for joining us today, and I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Leah Schwartzman is the Central Valley Program Coordinator at California Farm Link. Since 2010, she has supported hundreds of farmers and ranchers in accessing land, securing strong tenure agreements, exploring financing, and facilitating farmland and business succession plans. Leah frequently speaks at workshops and conferences on topics of importance to beginning and retiring farmers and ranchers. So Leah, 
Thanks for joining us. And it looks like you're going to hand us the keys to success in um, purchasing farmland from your photo there. <laughs> Thank you. I sure hope so. Um, thanks, folks, for joining us this afternoon. Um, again, my name is Leah Schwartzman. I'm the Central Valley Program Coordinator with California FarmLink. Um, for those of us who are not familiar with FarmLink, we are a nonprofit organization and a community development financial institution. Uh, we work with farmers throughout California. We began in a, 1999 where we identified the major barriers for farmers uh, starting and sustaining successful businesses um, as access to land and access to capital. So we have a access to land program where we have an online listing of land opportunities available throughout much of the state. And we support farmers in negotiating and developing equitable agreements um, as well as uh, helping retiring farmers and next generation farmers with uh, transition planning for their farms and businesses. Our access to capital program, we are a CDFI. And so we offer um, anywhere from 1500 to um, $1.75 million loans to uh, farmers and ranchers in California. And uh, we, target our, um, our financing at those who would not necessarily be able to qualify for financing through other sources. So we're looking at those underserved and underbanked communities um, who, uh, who need that financing. And um, we've been proud to uh, deploy over $10 million in capital to those communities. So we're really proud about that. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit today about some options that you have when considering your pathway to ownership. Um, there's many ways to go about accessing land. Um, ownership is often the ultimate goal for farmers, um, but not always attainable in some areas, especially California, where prices are really high. So um, let's explore some ways that we can work towards that goal um, and maybe think a little bit creatively about uh, how we secure long-term tenure. So traditionally, uh, you, you married, you inherited um, land or farm businesses, uh, but many farmers are, or next uh, heirs to farmers are not going into farming. And so um, a lot of our next generation farmers are, did not grow up in farm families. So um, many are having off farm income um, or they're starting by financing as a, uh, a house and building equity that way. There's also opportunities to sell conservation easements. Um, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about this lease to own, which I don't really, that's a common way of referring to it, but I prefer to call it a pathway to ownership. Um, and there are even more creative ideas of uh, using sweat equity to, um, to build up equity in a property uh, over time. So the first uh, concept that I want to discuss here uh, is a ground lease. What a ground lease is, is a ownership of infrastructure on leased land. So this could be that a farmer either builds or purchases a barn, let's say, on a property and they own the barn, but they don't own the land. Um, the, this is a permanent model. It's, it's, you see it a lot in commercial real estate uh, where a big company will lease some expensive ground and then build a grocery store on there. They own the grocery store, but they lease the land long term. Um, it is it, it it is an opportunity for equity. It's a transferable asset, um, and it uh, it also increases in value over time, similar to owning a house or land. Um, it's really important to make sure documentation of a ground lease is done well and done right. Um, you're usually involving a team of folks, including lawyers and CPAs, um, and you want to make sure that this is. Um, something that's recorded with the property deed so that you're dotting all your T's and checking all your I's. 
The next ideas that I want to bring to the table here is what people commonly refer to as lease to own. I like to call these pathways to ownership. I think that a lot of folks think of a lease to own as a situation where you're making payments that go towards a per eventual purchase. And I want to caution people about doing that. Um, in, in some cases, you will be required to put a little bit of um, capital or consideration up front, but you have to make sure that that's very well documented because if the purchase does not go through, it's hard to get that money back. So these can be done without consideration, and uh, but you should check with your local state um, about whether it's required in your state or not. Uh, so the first of these options is a right of first refusal or a first right of refusal. They're very similar. Um, in this case, you are writing into your lease this clause that states that um, in the event that the owner is going to sell, you get the first stab at it. So um, you usually have an opportunity of time after the uh, owner let in and notifies you that they're making it for sale or that they've received an offer in order to match that offer. And what's great about it is you have to match the offer exactly. So if you decline the offer and during the negotiation process, the price or terms change, you get another stab at it. So for example, a uh, a landowner is going to sell the property $100,000 and you say, no, I'm not going to buy it for $100,000. And then they go back and in negotiations that $100,000 becomes $90,000. Well, then you get another chance. Um, depending on how your right of first refusal is written, you get another chance at $90,000 at any other time that the um, exact uh, offer is changed. So it doesn't guarantee that you'll be in a position um, but it's yours to say no to. So it can be a really strong um, option to put in really any lease uh, if you can. Uh, the, the downside to a landholder is that it ties up the process a little bit. So not every landholder is going to be willing to do this, but especially if you have a property that you're going to be, you have a long-term lease, you're going to be investing some significant capital in that, I'd throw it in whatever your lease you can throw it into. Now the option to purchase is, uh, is a stronger option. Essentially, it is setting up a time frame for you to purchase a, the property. Um, in many cases, it will in fact set up the terms of the purchase as well. So the price um, and the time frame that that option triggers. Um, I, I recommend that soon after putting a option to purchase in your lease, that you follow that up soon after with an, uh, with an actual purchase agreement as well. Um, they don't have to name a predetermined price. They can say the price uh, market value at the time of purchase, um, but it's great if they do because then you can really plan for your purchase and start saving for a specific goal. Okay, so when, um, Many, many folks want to own land. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about the benefits of leasing, things to consider when leasing, and also the benefits of purchasing and things to consider. So um, there's there's obviously several advantages to leasing land. Um, it's lower risk. It, it doesn't tie up capital in the early stages of your operation. Um, it allows for relatively easy liquidation uh, which reduces risk especially if you if you plan for having your farm having essentially wheels under it especially if you have a shorter term lease um, and it, it frees up that capital to invest in things like equipment um, or livestock which can help you save money for an eventual land purchase um, some things to consider, there's, there's a lot of benefits to leasing, but um, it's important to consider that it offers less security than owning. Um, it's really important to have a written agreement versus an oral one. And um, while you can have a long-term lease that includes renewal provisions, um, 
many leases can just be year to year and that that doesn't offer very much security for a farmer. And it's obviously harder to build equity uh, when leasing land. Note that when you're working on a lease, you have to make sure that you're working with, with a landholder who is who you feel comfortable communicating with. It's important for you to keep consistent communications with a landholder. Um, that landholder may have ideas about the property and how they want it to be used or what goals they have. Um, they may want it to look a certain way. Um, and so making sure that you really talk through all the needs and expectations of both parties at the onset of the of the agreement and maybe even include some of that language in your lease agreement is really important to establishing that baseline expectation and then keeping that relationship going um, with open and honest communication, I think is the best way to have a long-term relationship with a landholder. So, um, there's obviously many benefits as well to owning land. Um, by purchasing land, it gives you the uh, bundle of rights that comes with land ownership, which includes the right of control or to use the property however you want, and the right of exclusion, which is deciding who comes onto your property or not, um, and the right of disposition, which means you can sell it, you can transfer, you can give away your land. Um, in the state of California, availability of land and price of land is something to consider. Um, it requires a substantial investment, um, which often requires financing. So making sure that you're in a financial position, that you have all your financial documentation in order. Um, a lot of folks talk about land, um, historical land ownership as being land rich and cash poor. That's a that's a real conundrum um, because oftentimes our equity is tied up in the land itself. Um, and for something that you've worked so hard on and often folks don't have an intention of selling the land ever, um, while you've built equity, it's hard to use that equity. And um, there's a lot of uh, liability and risk in owning land um, and more costs than just the purchase of the land. Think about all of the operating costs, the maintenance costs, the bills and taxes that that accumulate over time. Um, it's not just a one and done. You purchase the land and um, and, and there's no more expenses. <laughs> so obviously consider the, the cost of the land um, into the future. So one tool uh, to help with the cost either initial or to give an influx of cash is to sell a conservation easement. Um, this can lower a purchase price, um, but know that it will often limit your development envelope. You'll have, you'll be given a specific area because you're selling your development rights. You won't be able to just do anything with the land anymore if you sell a conservation easement. So um, there'll be specific parameters for how and where you can build any infrastructure. Um, know that there are different types of conservation easements that I'm not gonna go into too detail, too much detail on today, um, but there are affirmative agricultural easements um, and there are easements that uh, require that in the event of, this, of a sale that it's purchased at the agricultural value of the property. So keep in mind that there are some creative tools that are being used out there to make conservation easements more ag friendly. Um, so the sale of an easement can lower the cost of the property at the time you sale, sale in time you buy in order to buy out off-farm heirs or retiring generation. Um, donating an easement can offset taxes um, and the sale of an easement can serve as a down payment. The value that you get for selling your easement is gonna differ depending on the development pressure of the area that you're purchasing. So in some cases, an easement is not gonna be worth as much as you would want it to. And in other cases, you know, it can take a million dollars off of a sale price. It just depends on where you are. Um, it's really important to work very closely with the land trust or institution that you are um, 
working with to create the easement um, and who will ultimately hold the easement. Uh, know that this is not a quick process. It can often take a, a few, up to a few years. So um, while it's time consuming, it can be a really rewarding process. And in doing so, you will have preserved um, beautiful agricultural land in perpetuity. So good on you. So any of these models can be done in an installment or a land contract sale. And typically this is just a purchase, like a slow purchase over time with owner financing. Um, note that um, each side should really understand the other's motivation in doing this. Um, it requires a, a really strong relationship with the landholder who is essentially holding your note. And of course, it, it has risk and you have to make sure that it's very well documented how this process works. Usually there's a balloon payment somewhere along the way. So know that that can be where things go very wrong for a farmer because farming is a risky business and you don't know where you will financially be by the time that balloon payment comes about. So just make sure that you're really working with a financial professional to help you plan for these payments and the balloon payment. Um, FSA may be able to guarantee payments. That is to the landholder. So if, if, a, if an installment sale is set up, the landholder would work with FSA to guarantee your payments. But note that that program is not currently available in California. So it's, it's important to understand um, all the financial considerations when deciding on the path to land tenure that best suits you now and in the future. Um, similar to purchasing, there are costs beyond the lease rate or the purchase price. There's maintenance costs, there's taxes and insurance. Um, be sure to factor in things like upkeep, um, and understand both your personal and your business financial resources and the income potential of the property and of your enterprise so you can know what you can afford and avoid getting in over your head. These are, um, these are big decisions and that's why advanced planning is really essential. So, both purchasing and leasing land is a financial commitment. And um, both a landlord and a lender will wanna make sure that you can make those payments. And uh, both are gonna require certain documentation to prove your credit worthiness. So the requirements for a lease are usually less extensive than a purchase but a lesser will still want to um, have some assurances that you can cover the cost of the lease and that you're an experienced farmer who, um, who's ready to start or expand their farm business. Um, lease arrangements vary widely and I recommend working with a professional to negotiate and develop your agreement because there may be language or considerations that you haven't thought of that um, are important to talk about at the onset of a lease. I often say that some of the best leases that I've negotiate, negotiated are the ones that both parties walk away from. Um, the negotiation process, I can't stress enough, is, is an extremely important process that shouldn't be rushed. So before you even get there, <laughs> a landlord may wanna see a few of these things, things like references, um, both personal or potentially from previous uh, landlords, a credit report, cash budget, business plan, and they're gonna to wanna to see a legal contract between the two of you. Similarly, um, the requirements for purchasing a property are a little more extensive and the lender's gonna to wanna to make sure you've got all your financial documents in hand. Um, so these are things like tax returns. Those are usually gonna be your schedule F, F for farmer tax, return, tax uh, returns and um, references, a credit report, business plan, uh, catch budget. Just when approaching a lender, be ready. Um, know your financial position. Know how much you can uh, repay and how much down payment you have. Have all of these uh, documents in order and be familiar with their contents. 
and demonstrate your experience and your profitability. And also be honest about areas where you could use improvement because your lender is going to find them. And if you're up front at the beginning of those conversations about where you have room for improvement or where there was a hiccup along the way and ways that you are working to remedy that, they're going to respect um, that and respect that you told them up front. So with that last slide, we kind of already started getting into it, but let's talk a little bit about financing land. So I first want to say that banks need your business. It's always a good idea to shop around, uh, know your options, and find a lender that you are comfortable sharing intimate details about your life and business with because this is somebody that you're going to really be opening up to and so it's important that that's somebody that you feel comfortable working with and if you found a financial institution that you like working with but maybe you don't like working with the particular person that you've been talking with it, it's okay to ask for somebody else just know that you're the one who has the business and uh, and you're in a position of power there so with that said, there's first place to start is always USDA FSA. Um, they just increased their purchasing limit to $600,000, yay. Um, there's also American Ag Credit. Um, Cal Coastal is a local bank uh, in the uh, Central Coast region where actually FarmLink started our lending was through them. Um, there's all kinds of really cool peer-to-peer -peer lending and crowdfunding options. Um, Kickstarter barn raiser is farm specific. Um, there's peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending like Kiva Zip, Lending Club, and Prosper. Kiva Zip can offer zero interest rate loans. Um, I think they increased their limits recently as well. Um, and these are these are loans versus gifts. So that's the difference between crowdfunding and online peer-to-peer -peer lending. The lending is actually a loan. It can include an interest rate and sometimes a high one, uh, depending on your credit worthiness. Crowdfunding is gonna be donations. Just know that both of these are very public facing types of, um, types of fundraising options. So you have to have a good story, uh, know how to use your social media, um, and it can it can take a lot of work to get these things funded um, and you're competing with a lot of other projects. So just keep that in mind as you enter into any of these crowdfunding or peer to peer lending opportunities. Um, there's also private investors and grants out there. There's an organization called Slow Money that gathers them together. Um, there's niche loan funds out there as well. So FarmLink works with a couple of uh, cooperatives um, markets that have niche loan funds. Um, one's called Briar Patch in the Nevada County area where we work with um, the market in order to help uh, finance some of the growers that supply to them. Um, but there's, uh, Whole Foods does one too. And then of course there's California Farm and Loan Program. Uh, we are, we can currently and probably in the future only finance uh, operations in the state of California. So it's important to be prepared. And here are some uh, good questions to ask. And be sure to ask a lot of questions of your lender. Empower yourself through planning and preparation. Remember that they need your, bu your business and you're in a position of power. So uh, what's the interest rate is a good place to start. And um, ask if that's a monthly or annual interest rate. Know about the term of the loan and um, whether their payment schedules are flexible or not. I know that farming um, isn't always a, uh, farmers don't always get a regular weekly payment for product, it often comes at once. So um, work, out, work that out with your, um, with your lender. Find out if there are prepayment penalties. Um, find out if your lender reports to the credit bureaus and what happens in the event of a default. And again, make sure that you're comfortable with the lender and the loan that you're discussing. So a land loan timeline looks a little bit like this. You 
decide you're ready, you find the right lender. Um, if, if possible, get pre-qualified. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, find the right property, sign a purchase agreement. Um, the lender's gonna then order an appraisal. And then the lender is going to be underwriting the loan and sending it for approval. If approved, it may need a guarantee. Um, and then you'll close the loan. Be sure to give yourself a couple of months, two to three, for the entire process. So what's a down payment anyway? Um, it's, it's important to um, discuss with your lender what percentage of down payment they're going to be asking for. Um, FSA does have some down payment assistance programs. Typically, they're going to be looking at between 5 and 30 percent. Um, this is essentially how much you are putting into the purchase. It's your skin in the game. A lender likes to see that. If they're going to be investing in you, they like to see that you're investing in yourself as well. Um, a down payment can be a gift as well, um, but that has to be clearly documented. The more money you put down, the easier it is to um, find financing. So here's that pre-qualification again, or pre-approval. Um, based on some documentation that you provide to the lender, um, they are saying that it seems like a loan that they can make, and then they give you this document that you can then take to potential sellers and say, look, I already have been pre-approved for a loan for this amount. So the process won't take long and there won't be any hiccups. Of course, it's not a guarantee that the lender will provide financing to you, um, but it is a good faith. We've looked at your records and it, it looks pretty good. Um, this is not something that FSA can offer but a lot of different financial institutions can, including FarmLink. So um, working with an agent or a broker can be very helpful in developing documents, but it's not required. Um, a seller will likely, but not always, be working with a broker to list the property. A broker can represent both the buyer and seller, but it's not really recommended because it's difficult for the agent to truly represent both parties interests um, if both parties have agents it can help facilitate the transaction but if only one party does the party with the agent has an unfair advantage in negotiating the transaction so i would either say i would say if you're in a situation where the other party has an agent i would get one too um, make sure that you set up a reasonable escrow period um, which gives you enough time, and I recommend even more cushion um, until the loan must close. Remember that two to three month timeline for the land loan. I would give yourself at least three months in escrow. Um, and be sure to tell your lender as soon as your purchase agreement is signed um, so that they can get to work. Appraisals for farmland um, are different than conventional real estate appraisals. Um, they are required to verify the value of the property and oftentimes include infrastructure as well. You're going to need 30 to 60 days to get a ag appraisal complete, so be sure to plan for that in advance. I also don't recommend doing it before you have spoken with your lender because oftentimes a lender has an approved list of appraisers and they may not accept the one that you use, and that would be an expensive mistake because um, the cost can vary anywhere from $2,000 to $6,000. So be sure to work with your lender in picking out your, um, your appraiser and give yourself plenty of time. So the lender is taking two, three months. What are they doing? Well, what they're doing is underwriting your business. Um, they're looking at your ability to make payments and comparing that with the value of the land and uh, comparing the, the appraisal with the value of the land um, and the sale price and making sure that everything lines up. And then they're sending it for approval and potentially getting a guarantee on your loan. So this means that if you are unable to pay, um, another source will pay for your default, which is usually the federal government. 
Um, so a lot of banks will want to get a guarantee, especially on high value land price uh, purchase. So um, again, it's not just the purchase price that is included in a purchase of a of farm. Um, there are a bunch of closing costs associated. So we talked about the appraisal um, being between two and six thousand um, dollars. Your your uh, title company will often charge up to three thousand. Um, there's inspection costs as well, up to five thousand. Then there will be loan fees, which are different from lender fees. Loan fees are going to be between a half a percent and two percent of the loan amount. Um, and the lender fee is usually two to five hundred dollars or so, and this is including things like credit reports and UCC1 filings. And then there's some guarantee fees as well. So um, assuming a, the FSA guarantees the loan, it's usually between zero and um, for those who qualify and are approved for the FSA down payment program and up to 1.5 percent of the loan amount. So um, so yeah, so your purchase agreement will determine uh, who is responsible for which of these expenses. So be sure to uh, include these expenses uh, in your estimation of your purchase price. And with that, that was a brief introduction to some creative pathways to ownership, as well as um, financing a land purchase. And do we have questions? Hi, Leah. Yes, we do have some questions. Um, thanks for that overview. Uh, and so we had a couple questions come in during the presentation. And if you have any questions that you'd like to write in now, feel free to go ahead and send those in to us. So there was a clarifying question. Um, someone wanted to know a little bit more about what a balloon payment is. Sure, so a balloon payment, essentially land contract and installment sales uh, are where the landholder is holding the note. They are financing it. Um, and so, the payments can be structured in a number of ways and they can include a lot of the things that a normal loan would include like interest rate and things like that um, but what they do is they often have a cutoff point so five ten years down the road and those regular payments stop and just the remainder of what is owed is due all in one fell swoop so that's a balloon payment okay great thank you and we had someone else write in wondering why the FSA loan guarantee program is not currently available in California. So the loan guarantee program is available in California. The land contract guarantee is not. And I, um, I think I think it's because it's not as common here. And so the service providers for FSA just are not familiar with it. Okay, thanks. I've asked the question myself. I'm sorry, I don't have a great <laughs> answer. They just don't do it here. Um, no one has, no one knows how to do it here. <laughs> All right. Well, that's, maybe that's a good question for FSA in the in the future if we ever have them online again. Yeah, um, yeah. I've asked them as well, and they just they're not sure either. <laughs> okay, that's good to know. Um, kind of on a similar theme with the the FSA loan guarantee, someone just wrote in wondering. Uh, what's the the limit on those, assuming there is one? They have a maximum. They just up their limits to six hundred thousand um, dollars for their land loans. Great, thanks. And then um, you had someone that was wondering what are some good strategies for a farm family that's looking to sustain the farm across generations. That's a big question. Um, well, some of these options um, 
some of these pathways to ownership are a good way for the next generation to have some skin in the game and provide some um, retirement income for the re for the retiring generation. Um, I, I would have a whole bunch of questions for the family who's involved. Um, if if the uh, heirs are farmers as well, or if they're looking for an um, a non heir farmer to be the next generation farmer for transition. I think I would start with open and honest communication between as many generations as are interested or involved, and maybe a few off farm heirs who aren't as well, so that everybody's on the same page, um, and start planning early. Um, I think one of the one of the greatest points where I see challenge in these transitions is the transition of management responsibilities between generations. So coming up with, with a plan and a timeline for that and making sure that everyone's sticking to it and meeting the expectations that are set out uh, is a really, a really great uh, place to start. Um, and you don't have to do this alone. There are so many different support service providers out there for you. It requires a team requires a village and it requires as many members of the family to be involved as possible to make sure that that transition is successful. Great, thank you. And then going back to um, the loan guarantees, we just had a question came in that says, if not the FSA, who then would act as a loan guarantor for loans over a million dollars? Is it possible to have two guarantors? I think it's possible um, to have more than one guarantor because um, regular folk can also be a guarantor on a loan. So, like, if you have a family member who's willing to put their name on the line, um, or potentially a um, an investor, those are options as well. Um, but there's a bunch of uh, financial institutions, but usually federal, that offer guarantees. But the financial institution that you're working with, it will support you in, in figuring that all out. Great, thank you. So I think we're gonna wrap things up for questions for Leah right now, but if something comes up and you wanna send it in during the next half of the presentation, feel free to do so. And we'll have kind of like an open question and answer session at the end of the webinar. So Leah, thanks again. Um, and we will loop back around with you at the end of the webinar. So next I would like to introduce our Michael. Um, Parker, who is the Land Access Program Associate at the National Young Farmers Coalition. Mike helps beginning farmers understand their financial decisions related to accessing land through the Young Farmers Finding Farm Land Calculator, as well as in-person and online education projects. He has very professional experience in farm direct marketing, including as a farm worker, a food hub marketing associate, a farmer's market manager, a caterer, and a writer. Mike holds a degree in accounting from Georgetown University. So Mike, thanks for being with us here today and I'm going to switch the screen over so you can show us the new tool that the National Young Farmers Coalition put together. Cool, okay, thank you, Megan. Thank you everybody for joining. Um, before I get into showing everybody the Finding Farmland Calculator, I just wanted to share a couple words about the National Young Farmers Coalition. Um, we are a national grassroots advocacy group. Um, so that means we're working on improving public policy and improving public programs for young farmers. We do that at mostly at the federal level, so working on the farm bill every five years as it comes up. Um, and also in some different states. So for instance, in Sacramento, we do have a federal uh, state policy associate, um, Ernesto, who is working every day on California state policy and um, making that better for young, young and beginning farmers in the state. Um, we are a chapter-based organization. So we have 43 chapters that are 
all farmer led in 30 states. Um, gasp along with me, but we have no chapters in California right now. Uh, and there are three groups of farmers in different parts of the state who are trying to start chapters. Um, so feel free to reach out to me after the, uh, after the webinar if um, you're interested in being part of that organizing effort in the state. Um, and just one thing to note, so this is our website, youngfarmers.org. Um, but one thing I always want to mention when I speak with farmers is that, so we're a membership organization for $35 a year, you can be a Young Farmers Coalition member. Um, and the great thing, one of the great things about being a member is that you get all these different discounts here. Um, and I can't tell you the number of times I've spoken to farmers at conferences and they're like, wait, for $35, I could have saved, you know, $300 off my Johnny's order last year, um, whatever it is. So I just want to make sure that's noted while I'm here. So my work is not in organizing farmers or in advocacy around farmers. My work is in providing um, business services and specifically education to farmers. Um, and that's something that the Young Farmers Coalition has started doing um, because in all of our organizing and advocacy work, we found through surveys, through just relationships with farmers that land, access to land um, is Young Farmers' number one stated challenge. Um, and I think Leah even mentioned in her presentation that back in 1999, that's <laughs> what uh, California FarmLink was founded based on. And uh, that's still no different today. And even in our surveys of um, young farmers who are intergenerational farmers who have inherited land or have the opportunity to inherit land, um, even those kinds of farmers report that land access and, and the, the associated issues like access to credit um, are their number one challenge that they face. So in an effort to address this, unfortunately, um, we don't have quite the political power yet to uh, just broadly reduce the cost of farmland to people, um, but we're working on it. And in the meantime, we try to put together projects that can help farmers do one of the main things they, they can do to um, approach accessing land more responsibly and more confidently, and that's learning about it. Um, learning about your financial options and learning about strategies that farmers across the country are using to make farmland access more affordable um, or the process suit their their own startup process better. So the first tool that I want to show everybody and walk everybody through is this finding farmland calculator. And we developed this tool. It's a it's a mortgage calculator, but sort of a unique mortgage calculator that helps farmers understand their specific financing options and also kind of get a look behind the scenes of what lenders are looking at when they're considering you as a loan candidate um, so that you could make yourself a better loan candidate. So to start off here, when you go to, this is just at findingfarmland.org, you get here. And we can put in a property price to create a scenario, but I have some scenarios built as an example. So I just wanna walk you through the tool first. So here in this financing section, what you're essentially doing is building the different ways that you would finance a land purchase. And Leah spoke a lot about these different ways. Um, one of them is just a very conventional loan that you would get through a bank. And there's also usually a down payment associated with the loan. So you could add all these different items. And you'll see the calculator throughout has some different um, educational features. So for instance, if you didn't know what an FSA loan is or what the FSA is, you can pop that open, learn a little bit about it, read our guidebook that we wrote about it, go right to the FSA website. If you click this loan box and you're really new to the process, you didn't realize that when you get a loan for land, usually there's a down payment associated with it. The calculator gives you a little warning that could kind of explain what you're doing wrong. Also, there's definitions throughout. So if you don't know what amortization means, you hover over and you learn that it's just the time period over which your loan is paid off. So let's just walk through a couple of the other, maybe more complicated financing options here. So there's down payment, there's loans, there's FSA loans. And since FSA has a few different types of ownership loans, we have this little drop down here that I can explain the different ones. And then the rules associated with those different loans are built into the calculator. So it could tell you if you're, if you're doing something wrong. 
as Leah mentioned, you'll see if you could see this close to the screen. Um, right now we have the maxes in as 300,000 because that's what the loan max was up until the end of last year. Um, but with the farm bill, those doubled 600,000. So we'll be updating the calculator soon. But you'll just have to ignore the if you go over the max. Um, we have this lease to own feature. So this is if you want to add a lease before the purchase period, if you want to include that in your model. And conservation easements, as Leah mentioned, are a way to make properties more affordable by selling some conservation rights on your land. Um, and we have it so that you could add a conservation easement at the time of purchase. So if you've done your work ahead of time and you're working for several years on, on purchasing a property, usually if the landowner is involved in that project, um, you could get a conservation easement at the time of purchase to reduce the property price. Um, put something in there. Oh, I need property price in order to show you. Okay, there you go. And you could also put it on loan later in the payback period, which is more likely how people will get conservation easements. Usually you buy the property, you own it, and then you're working with the land trust to conserve it. So as Leah mentioned, there are more costs to property ownership than just the purchase price. Um, there is at the time of purchase various closing costs. There are property taxes, there's property insurance. You might have to make a capital investment in the property when you buy it in order to build infrastructure that your business needs. And what we don't have here because it's really hard to predict in, on a regular schedule is upkeep. So that's just something to, to remember that if you own land rather than lease it, your upkeep costs are probably a lot higher. Skip over the cost section for now. So the second half of the calculator is a financial statement section where you could enter information about your business coming probably straight from your business plan. Um, and if you enter that, so it, there's income, personal income and business income. There's a personal balance sheet, so your own personal assets, your personal liabilities, business assets, business liabilities. And if you enter in all that information, you get this affordability outlook. And this section is showing you um, some of the major financial ratios that a lender uses to evaluate their loan candidates. Um, and I'll give you an explanation of what the ratio is, how it's calculated, and I'll give you um, what your ratio is for this scenario as you enter in the information. And then there's some more information in the bottom. I'll show you the lease versus buy calculator once we have some, and the equity section once we have some information loaded in. And the last thing to show you is just that you can download your scenario as a PDF. So again, once we have information here, we'll, um, we'll do that so you can see what it looks like. Oh, one thing I didn't mention with the, with the loan input, since we were talking about balloon payments, let's put in a price here, whatever, it's 20,000, very cheap property. <laughs> um, so say you were in a contract agreement with, um, you know, you're doing a contract sale with the landowner. Um, so you got a, basically a loan from them for $20,000. You're paying some amount of interest. And so you're amortizing that over a 20 year period, but you actually are planning on making a balloon payment after 10 years. So that's essentially what, let's make this a little bigger so it seems realistic. So essentially what you're doing there is at that end of the 10 years, you're not necessarily just gonna pay your own cash to, um, to the landowner. Uh, even though the balloon payment is saying that the landowner is gonna get cash somehow, more likely you're gonna refinance this loan at that point. So you're saying in 10 years, you're gonna refinance this loan. So that's one way the calculator can be used to figure out what that balloon payment would be. So at the end of that 10 years, you'll still have $305,000 in principal remaining, and you'd probably get a bank loan for that, and it lets you, you know, not just the rate, and maybe you'd want to pay that out over 20 years. And he gives you some information about that. 
So let's take a look at how the calculator is actually used with a few different scenarios that I've got set up here. So if you notice in this top right box here, there you have the ability to switch your scenarios and you can name your scenarios whatever you want. So this could be used, I tend to like to use it to look at one property, so like one property at one price and look at financing in a few different ways so that you could compare and contrast how um, different financing options turn into different monthly payments or different total costs. Um, but you could also just put in different properties here and you know, put the address as the name or something um, and just compare what the costs are between different properties and the same financing options. And in the top right here, you can just switch between scenarios. So I've got this one $600,000 property set up as a pretty conventional purchase, uh, joint financing with FSA and our pathway to ownership example. So let's start with the conventional purchase. So this is a $600,000 property and most, uh, most lenders, whether it's a bank or American Ag Credit, um, we'll be looking for something like a 25% down payment, a pretty high down payment. Um, so I just entered the down payment as 25%. I put in the remainder, which was $450,000 at a 6% interest rate. And I'm not sure what the standard is by you guys for residential. I live in New York. Um, most residential mortgages are 30 year, but our farm credit institution, Farm Credit East, usually their ownership loans are 25 year amortization. Um, so this would be a really standard loan, and you might be looking at this if you don't own property right now and seeing this $150,000 number and thinking, how am I supposed to save up $150,000 <laughs> to buy property? Um, and that's a good question, and it, typically people that are buying property with these kinds of down payments um, are able to do it because they're selling another piece of property. They have some other asset that they're getting. Um, they have built some equity in, they're selling that, so they have cash for the down payment, they're able to maybe upgrade to a more expensive property. Um, so you see the next example, these closing costs are probably a little bit low, but I've got them the same in the other ones, so I'm just gonna leave it. And we get a little breakdown of how much it costs to buy the property with this conventional um, kind of financing scenario. So it's about a little over 3,000 a month that you're paying us mortgage payment, just to that one loan, you'll see it on there, some taxes, some insurance every month. Pretty straightforward. So let's look at a different way of financing this because maybe you're not in a situation where you own property now and you have this amount of money in equity so you, you're not able to afford this down payment. So you look at a kind of joint financing and Leah mentioned it, there is this FSA down payment loan. And the down payment loan is specifically for beginning farmers and um, socially disadvantaged farmers, which include women farmers and um, racial minorities. And that, so the way this works, and you can see the description here, it requires a 5% down payment, so much lower down payment from you, and a bank loan for 50% of the property price. And then FSA, as a loan to you, gives you the rest of the money as a down payment at a one and a half percent interest rate for a 20 year period. So really here, you're putting down a $30,000 down payment and taking out two loans, one really low interest rate loan with Farm Service Agency and one um, more standard loan. So you were putting in the same interest rate, same amortization period. But because FSA is giving you this down payment loan, you're, you're coming to the deal to whoever this other lender is, California FarmLink, American Ag Credit, and it's looking like you're putting a 50% down payment, but really you're only putting a 5% down payment. Put in the same purchasing costs, property costs. And now you see it's gonna cost you more monthly, but we could swap back and forth here. So it's about $400 more a month. But the big difference is that you didn't have to come up with $150,000 in cash this is a more reasonable amount that you might be able to save up towards. And the total cost is just over a million here. So it's about $100,000 less over the total 25 years of the purchase. And so now in this example, 
I also filled out some of the financial statement information. Oh no, it disappeared. <laughs> okay, well, we'll be able to fill that out in the next one. All right, so I'm gonna look at, so maybe you're still in the situation where you're looking at this conventional. Oh no, I was just looking at the wrong one. Okay, let's keep going with the financial statements then we'll go to the third one. So in this scenario, we're looking at a farm that grosses a quarter million dollars a year. And you can see, I just put in some sample data for what the various operating expenses are. Um, the calculator automatically calculates what your loan expenses for a year. So those are the payments in your loan. Um, and I'm putting in some farm income here. If you had off farm income, you could also put your off farm income if you would, if you want your lender to think of that as part of what you're going to be using to pay back the loan. This person has some personal assets and has um, some student loans that they're paying off. And they have a few business assets. And you'll see with all the red and yellow down here that the affordability outlook's not great. Uh, this, is, they're, this would be way over leveraging this person. So their, um, their income, 90% of their income would be used to be paying back loans every year. Um, just their their you know mortgage every year. So obviously this seems out of like out of the question for this person um, to be paying this much money. Um, they would absolutely get turned down by their lender uh, showing this amount of income and trying to buy this kind of property. So what can this person do, or what's one thing that this person do or this couple do um, in order to make this property affordable for them? And one thing I like to think about is how can they increase these numbers because if you increase this to say i don't know 80 and you got some off farm income so that seems pretty pretty drastic right so then they've got a fair debt to income ratio maybe they could afford this property maybe a lender will take a look at them if this is if that were their income but that's you know that's a hundred percent increase in your income how are you supposed to double your income just like that um, and often you need time to do that in a farm business. Like, you know, you might have a very successful farm business on leased land. You're doing, you're doing great in your startup years. Um, but you might need some kind of infrastructure, some larger land or, um, property or property closer to markets in order to really increase your sales and get to a point of, um, scale and maturity. Um, and to do that, you might need to buy property or, or be there long-term to be willing to make those kinds of investments in a property. Um, and like Leo is saying, you might not want to make those kinds of investments on a property that you're just leasing short term and you have no um, option to purchase in the future, no plans to purchase in the future. So I built this other scenario, which we're calling our pathway to ownership scenario, which is exactly the same as the joint financing. The purchasing process is the same, the price is the same. The only difference is that for five years, we're leasing this property for $2,000 a month, which would be $24,000 a year, 20 acres, it's like a little over $1,000 an acre. You guys could tell me if that's reasonable and wherever you are in California. Um, I was recently in California and learned that there's a lot of unreasonable sounding prices out there. So you'll have to, you'll have to do this with your own um, reality in mind. Um, but so the idea here is that we have five years on this property. And in that five years, you'll be able to grow into your business a little bit more um, and grow to the point where, and you see, let's just look at the cost just for comparison's sake. So the cost is a little bit more and that's just because you're leasing for this first five years and that money is not going towards you owning the property. So this whole process just pushed back five more years. So I've updated these numbers a little bit here. And the big difference is in, so the gross sales. So I'm saying on this, if you have five years in this property, I'm saying we're gonna grow our business by about 25% and we're gonna double our income because our, our income from the farm is gonna increase and we're gonna find some other kind of off farm income. Say like this property has an extra house on it and we can rent it out as like a vacation property or um, maybe you or your partner find some kind of off-farm job nearby. 
also, if you're in the position where you have student loans, oh wait, they're wrong. Yeah. So if you're in the position where we have where you have student loans, that five, if you remember before, we had 60 months left on our loans, that's five years. So maybe you just need time to pay off your loans, which could help your personal balance sheet. And maybe you had a little bit of time also to build up some assets. So you know, you're building up, so you have 30,000 here, 10,000 other assets. In this scenario, you're building up some business inventory, um, you know, maybe you're pastured poultry and you got a bunch of chickens in the freezer now after five years and uh, you built up some infrastructure. And you see how, how you've improved all these different figures. So your personal debt to asset improved because you paid off your student loans. Your debt to income ratio improved because you are um, increasing your personal income and the property price is staying the same amount. Your profitability increased because you're increasing the amount of sales of your business on this new property because you've had five years to let your business mature. Um, and your liquidity is increasing because you have um, more current assets, you have more liquid assets. So things like, like this inventory is a liquid asset, it could be converted into cash readily. Um, you have a little bit more cash compared to what you had previously. And so the pathway to ownership just gives you the space and the ability to plan for your business um, to grow into um, the kind of scale that it would require to own a property like this and, and be able to cover those um, fixed costs of land ownership. There is a handy little tool here that can help you think a little bit more long-term about um, this lease versus buy decision. So if we want to say 20 years out in the future and we set our monthly rent, well, we set our yearly, yeah, we set our monthly rent was 2000. So this is just a little tool that's saying in 20 years, we're going to have earned $350,000 in equity on this property. We'll pay back $350,000 of the principal even though we're paying this much because that's all the interest that's involved too. Um, that's if we purchased it. If we rented it, we had been paying $480,000 in rent and have not earned any equity. So it gives you a bit of understanding of how long it takes to earn equity property. This chart kind of helps too. And in this scenario, remember we're leasing for this first five years. So if we, it would be even more dramatic of a difference if we looked at the joint financing. because this one is a purchase immediately. Yeah, so I'm gonna skip over equity and just show you, the last thing you can do is just download your scenario as a PDF. And it looks like this, and it's always in the wrong direction. And so this is just a little one pager, black and white. Um, something to note about the calculator is that it does not save the data that you enter into it. Like you notice you didn't have to create an account or anything like that. Um, so if I close this browser window, I'd lose all that data. So I, I always recommend that people, if you're putting a little bit of time into this, download this, um, your scenario's PDF, save it somewhere, print it. And this is also useful to bring to a lender that you might be working with. Um, because for a lender to come up with these numbers for you, sometimes, especially if you're working with FSA or something, it might require an office visit, a few emails. Um, but for you, it might be just as easy to, once you know the terms of the loans offered to you, just enter those numbers in yourself and get a good idea of what the payment period is going to look like. Another thing to note with those downloads, so I just, we're in the joint financing, I downloaded that one. You would need to switch your scenario in order to download all of them if you're looking at multiple scenarios. So that's the calculator. Again, you can find it at findingfarmland.org. If this is all feels over your head or at all feels over your head, or if you're looking just for more guidance on using the calculator, um, we also just last week released this Finding Farmland course which you can find through our website, farmers.org slash finding farmland course. I think it's also in the uh, handout that CCOF is gonna give to you guys. Um, but the course is just a step-by-step -step, nine lesson um, financial planning course. And throughout, you'll see we have lessons from different experts across the country on different topics related to land access and financial planning. And we've got all these different walkthrough videos here 
Um, so it's just a way for you to work at your own pace um, if you're trying to learn more about any of these other issues. And it's a good compilation of different resources related to uh, financial planning for land access. I think that covers my portion here. We could go to questions, but I'm going to switch over control. Great, thanks. And actually, why don't we leave um, your screen up just in case people have any questions where we want to bring up the calculator again. Good call. So if you have any questions, feel free to write them in. Um, and while we're waiting for folks, we had um, a couple of other questions in uh, Leah, feel free to jump in uh, if you'd like to on these. So someone was wondering, do either of you have experience with community land trust models and kind of what the first steps to um, working with that type of model would be? Well, for one author out there, so another member of our team does um, trainings with land trusts, kind of teaching land trusts how to work better with farmers. Um, but we have, I'll just jump to the course because it's the best way to see it in our partner section here. Uh, we have a great guidebook called The Farmer's Guide to Working with Land Trusts, which I would say is a really great resource to just get started learning about land trusts, learning about conservation easements. Um, and there's also some resources here about community land trusts, but that's, um, as Leo was mentioning, that ground lease model is just a, a way that a land trust or another kind of entity that's got like a long-term presence, um, long-term kind of cooperative presence can, that's a great way to work with an entity like that to, if, especially in a place like California where the property is just very expensive, um, but there's great markets for, for local food and great markets for agriculture in general. It's, it's a lot easier to make, to set up yourself for long-term success if you don't have to be exposed to that risk of really expensive property um, and increasing property prices if your business isn't exposed to that, um, which you could get around by working with a land trust and having a long-term lease through a land trust or just selling some of those development rights that really contribute to that um, widely um, increasing property price over time. Great, thanks. Leah, do you have anything you wanna add to that? Okay, so we also had someone um, who's a farmer in California and was just wondering if it's feasible to continue farming in California and you know, land prices are super high. <laughs> cost of living is super high. Um, so I don't know if you have experience working with California farmers or um, yeah, any anything you wanna add on to that question? I'll let you stand up for your constituency, Leah, first if you want. And Leah, I think you've muted yourself just Okay, so I think we're having a little audio issue here. Um, so, yeah, if you want to join us, or if not, we can follow up after the webinar with um, with some information on that. I can also, I mean, I'm happy to take a bit of a stab at that because that's a really hard question to leave lingering because of technical difficulty. Um, and yeah, I think. Of course, you have to think about it. If you're a young beginning farmer and you're looking at these costs of land, because I mean, even in the example I made, those seem like pretty drastic monthly expenses for owning property. And uh, while that kind of those kinds of fixed costs are are achievable to carry with a farm business and even a pretty small farm business of like a quarter million, third of a million dollars in, re in annual revenue. Um, that does seem overwhelming if somebody is, you know, starting up a business and maybe cash flowing like 50 grand a year at a market um like it seems totally unachievable um and i'd say that the main risk to get around the main thing to try to avoid maybe in california is land ownership um and 
if it's not the kind of if you don't want to be running the kind of larger scale medium scale farm um, that can justify those kinds of big fixed costs like just make sure it's not a fixed cost that your business has to carry um, there's lots of models out there for long-term leasing um, secure leasing these, these kind of ground leases that leah leah mentioned um, that are really useful to learn about and there's a lot of community groups and local governments uh, land trusts that are trying to preserve farming in their communities and um, farmers have this asset that a lot of people want them or they want to live around you they want to buy your food um, and you do need to work with other people to figure out if if you can't make it work through the sales of your business to own land um, then do you need to own land and if you don't need to own land how do you get access to that land without owning it but still is secure and long term and you're able to invest in infrastructure because um, that's the kind of equity you'll need to build like you'll need to if you're not going to build equity in farmland the way that people quote unquote traditionally built equity american farmers traditionally built equity which is this model of you know i'm not going to make very much money every year but at the end of my career i'm going to have this piece of land that i could sell to somebody um if that's not the model that you want to take and that doesn't have to be the only model for a successful farm career um, you just have to figure out how you're preparing long term financially if you're not putting that equity into, into farmland. Great, thank you. Um, and Leah, it looks like you're back online. Sorry about that. It wouldn't let me unmute. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think that that's a, that's a great answer. Um, I would advise folks that um, in, in the state of California, the maximum lease term is 51 years. Um, and a few notes, if, if you are able to enter into a ground lease, um, there's still a pretty new concept in, in agriculture. And so working with some folks who really know what they're doing, I think is very important. Um, there's a group called Equity Trust that has a lot of great resources on ground leases and have done some really innovative, um, oh, and he's right there. Jim Oldham. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, uh, NYFC and Michael put together this really great Finding Farmland course, so definitely play around with it. Um, and so if you aren't able to have a ground lease, which not, not all folks are able to do that, make sure that when you're working on a long-term lease and you are intending on investing in permanent infrastructure in a property that you are accounting for that infrastructure in your lease agreement. Um, FarmLink has created some really innovative language to essentially offer a, a protection on infrastructure, permanent infrastructure built on a property, which um, essentially is a buyback um, minus depreciation of the value of that infrastructure. My hope is that when you are planning for infrastructure on leased land, that you think about the usable life of that infrastructure and you try to have a lease um, as close to using up that usable life as possible. Um, and that you are also protecting yourself with language that offers some kind of a buyback because when you're investing in permanent infrastructure, you are increasing the value of the landlord's property that is not yours. And so you need to really account for that. Great, thank you. So we had a question come in that was wondering if FarmLink helps match make between aspiring farmers and retiring farmers to help them with succession planning um, or do you work primarily just with loans? We absolutely uh, work with uh, retiring farmers and landholders looking for land and next generation, uh, looking for farmers and next generation farmers looking for land. So um, you can go to CaliforniaFarmLink.org and check out um, our website and you can see some of the land opportunities that we have listed on the front page of the website. And if you meet our requirements for working and working with us and finding uh, land, which is a minimum of two years experience in commercial agricultural production, then you can register 
and be able to, to contact those landholders, as well as contact and communicate with other land seekers. So this is the front end of our website, but we have a brand new land portal. So when you register and log in, there's all kinds of cool stuff. It just launched last week um, where you can communicate with other land seekers, communicate with land holders, uh, favorite listings, uh, search, search and navigate the site. So um, yes, we absolutely do. Thanks. So I think why don't we switch presenters at this point and we'll do a quick wrap up. Um, if you have specific questions for kind of your situation on your farm or looking for a second opinion on how to finance things, I think both um, Leah and Michael, you're welcome to having people follow up with you, correct? Sure, correct. thanks. Yeah, okay. So if you have specifics, please follow up with them and they can, you know, really get to understand your story and um, and help you work through all of the finances and what's the best way to purchase or think about your business if that's something that's feasible for you. So I think we're going to wrap things up. Leah and Mike, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, it was a really great overview and a nice tutorial of the Finding Farmland calculator. So thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us today. Thank you. Thanks yeah. for having us. And here is, um, this will be in the handouts that we send out too, but it's just the link to the calculator and the course that uh, Mike was talking about. And just a few additional resources and Leah, feel free to jump in if you have anything else you wanna say about the Growing on Solid Ground. There's a publication by California Farm Link that is a farmer's guide to land tenure and it includes some case studies on organic farms. So there's some specific things that you might wanna think about when you're drawing up leases or um, that you could put in your um, conditions for a sale that will help you on some of your organic certification, such as having proof of land history um, when you go to get certified. If you include the proof of land history as a condition of the sale or lease, then you know you have that information um, for your certifier. So that's one resource. And, and then if you're really into financials and want to learn more about financial planning for farmers, we hosted a webinar with California Farm Link last year on that topic, and you can check it out on the CCOF website. And in June, we are going to have a webinar on record keeping for organic and food safety for produce growers, so check that out. And thanks again for joining us. Um, when you log out of the webinar and an evaluation form is going to pop up and we'd love to hear your um, what you have to say and get some ideas from you on future trainings as well as how we can improve our offerings. So thanks again and have a good afternoon. <laughs>